Applications on your phone can talk to each other, but the way that apps interact is still far from the way that web pages interact. Mike Wakerly is the CTO of Button, a service that connects mobile apps to each other. By embedding a component from Button into your app, you can easily request the functionality of an app while you are in a different app. In this episode, Mike and I discuss the future of mobile and the problems of app stores today, and the problems of apps interacting with one another, and how that experience can be improved. We also explore how mobile application context switching has improved, and how that creates business opportunities that are so much more interesting than advertising. Many fans of Software Engineering Daily are listening through the browser right now. The Practical Developer is the place to go to listen to Software Engineering Daily. We've teamed up with The Practical Developer to get a better browser experience, and The Practical Dev is really a great place to read about content uh, about software engineering. So check out our new site at dev.to slash sedaily. It's mobile-friendly. It's not a terrible user experience like our website is right now. That's dev.to slash sedaily. After a quick word from today's sponsor, we'll explore modern mobile apps with Button. Podcasting full-time is a great career, but if I ever return to the normal world of work, Hired.com is where I will start my job hunt. Hired.com removes the frustration of searching for a job. You just fill out your profile and the jobs come to you. Facebook, Uber, and Stripe are a few of the companies that are hunting for engineers on Hired. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily to try it out and get an extra $1,000 signing bonus just for using the URL for Software Engineering Daily listeners, which is Hired.com slash SE Daily. So if you want to try it out, go to Hired.com slash SE Daily. The demand for engineers is higher than the supply. And on Hired.com, that translates to higher salaries and happier careers for the engineers who find a job on Hired. I used Hired to find a job before I became a full-time podcaster. And the experience was so good because Hired connected me with a talent advocate who worked with me to find a job that was a good fit. And the talent advocate answered my questions about negotiating salary and finding remote work, which is which was something that was really important to me at the time. So check out Hired.com slash SE Daily and get a $1,000 signing bonus upon finding a job, which will be a great job that will give you the respect and the salary that you deserve as a great engineer. So check out Hired.com slash SE Daily. It would support the show. And now let's get on with today's episode of Software Engineering Daily. Button is a service that connects mobile apps. Mike Wakerly is the CTO at Button. Mike, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. So let's start by talking about what Button is, and then we will get into the engineering challenges. What is Button? Yeah, great question. So at a really high level, Button is a platform for connecting uh, mobile applications. So we build highly productized uh, experiences between apps. We like to think of ourselves as sort of a an antidote or alternative to advertising. Button builds very rich user experiences where you might see something you want to do. So let's say getting a car somewhere or buying tickets to a show. We provide the UI and the API integrations to show those in your application. And we provide a platform for the receiving side. We have partnerships with Uber, Ticketmaster, and so on for booking those transactions. So I think Uber is a canonical example, and there's a button that you can use to uh, request a ride with Uber, and and this is provided by a button or designed on the button platform. So if I have any type of app, I can add the ride with Uber button to my app. So what kind of app would want to have that kind of functionality? Yeah, so we look for, um, of course, we're open to any app, but uh, we find buttons work great where there's um, context where you might want to leave the application. So typically, like an Uber button does well in places uh, and applications that are about local points of interest. So one of our big customers is Foursquare. You might be looking at a restaurant or, you know, a place around town. You can throw an Uber button there and uh, get an immediate quote for all available options and uh, fares and so on. 
We look for places to put a button where there's somewhere where you might be tempted to go to your home screen or go to your mobile browser and search. And we think of the best buttons as the ones that save you from that extra click or that extra hop. So I want to get an idea for how this works. So for example, who made the Uber button? Was it an engineer working at Uber or was it an engineer somewhere else who wanted the Uber functionality in their app? How does this platform work? Yeah, we made that Uber button. So this uh, was one of our first buttons back in late 2014. So what a button is, is on a place where a button is integrated, it's little more than a template. It's a place in an application that says, show me something here. And so what our backend does is between that request and response, we go out and find content to put there. So specifically in the case of Uber, we've integrated with Uber's API. We've adapted it to a very abstract form of content, and we fill the button with that information. So when you see an Uber button, you're seeing basically a list of choices. But your application doesn't need to know anything about Uber's API. It doesn't need to have Uber's assets bundled with the application. And it's that sort of system that lets us light up all sorts of different connections without having to change your application. Okay, so when someone puts an Uber button in their app, you call it deep linking. What does that term mean, deep linking? Yeah, deep linking is a term that was sort of in vogue maybe one or two years ago when we were just getting started. And it makes a lot of sense, although it's something of a buzzword at some level. So deep linking in the app. I was going to say, because it sound, cause it, my impression is that kind of it's just like you click the button and it contacts a an endpoint somewhere. But maybe it's more complex than that because I could imagine a deep link being contrasted with that if you're actually switching within your within your application. Yeah, so deep linking is specifically about moving between applications on the mobile platforms, you know, iOS and Android. Apps can expose when you tap an app on your home screen, you're going to like the landing page of the application, much like when you type, you know, google.com, you go to the main page of Google. Deep linking was the term that sort of came about when, well, both platforms have supported this for for some time, but basically it's the technique of exposing uh, deeper content in your application directly through a navigable URL. So iOS and Android do it a bit differently, but uh, the general concept is you go straight to somewhere within the application, for instance, booking a ride or booking a table rather than the landing page. Hmm. So does the Uber button, for example, does it require any access to special APIs that the developer is not normally able to access, or are they just are they normal developer APIs that are public facing? Yes. So great question. So it varies depending on which partner we were talking about. So one of the benefits that kind of we stumbled upon as we were building more buttons was that hey, some APIs are public, some you have to you know sign a contract, some are private, some don't exist. So what we've done is we've kind of lumped all of those together and we provide a single, you know, unified API to all of those services. So Uber's API, we're not using anything private. It's, uh, you know, the third-party API you can get to at developer.uber.com. Well, certainly one thing that's compelling about Button is that it could be this kind of whitelist for APIs because obviously, you know, the ideal world is any developer can hit any API for anything and we just have this harmonious, beautiful world. But obviously that's not the way things can actually work and, and having some sort of platform that can broker relationships and whitelist certain developers to be able to use certain APIs by companies like Uber, even though you said you know Uber doesn't have any exposed particular APIs. I can imagine that being something that would happen in the future. Yeah, for sure. You know, we, um, we're we all developers here. You know, I think it's one of the things that, that I really enjoy about our work is, although sometimes people look at Button as this advertising platform, we're allergic to kind of all forms and all terminology uh, related to advertising because we take a very developer-first approach to things. And in the case of these APIs, it's, you know, we provide you coherency. Uh, an analogy I like to make is, um, you know, before Stripe existed, there were APIs for checkout. You know, there was probably someone at, uh, you know, authorized.net saying, hey, we have an API, but yeah, it was, you know, some ugly XML thing. <laughs> you needed a long, you know, sign-up process to get on it. And so we do that. So you can look at like any one of our partners individually, and they might be very easy to work with. But when you want to offer a connection to Uber for some things, open table for other things, maybe there's a different commerce partner in another part of the world, it starts to add up how many APIs and relationships you need to manage. So we're kind of a hub for that, regardless of which side you're on. 
Okay, great. So I want to talk a little bit more about the developer experience, and then we can come back to the overall product and marketplace of Button. If I'm writing an Uber button for iOS, how hard is it to translate that button to Android as well, or to translate it perhaps to even other other platforms, tablets or uh, something like that? Yeah, so today we support iOS and Android, and I think any form factor of those devices. So uh, the API, we try to we offer an SDK that basically wraps our backend API and our UI extensions. So you know we offer like the button itself is a is a widget on each platform in the respective uh, UI frameworks. So the interface uh, we try to keep as coherent as possible within the two platforms while staying idiomatic to the platform. So your work to integrate a button, keeping in mind that uh, I guess this was one of the challenges for us. There's a lot of interest in kind of the app indexing and app search space. And we take a very explicit approach to how you build a button. We say, carve out a space in your app, tell us what's going on in the app, and then you can configure what that's wired to on our back end. And the goal is basically, as a developer, you have a long lead cycle. Uh, you know, on the App Store, it can take a week for review, sometimes longer. We don't want you to have to change that a lot, but uh, we do need kind of the information necessary to fill that spot. So you bootstrap the button with as much as you want, but in this case, like your location. And then on our back end, you wire it up. You say, you know what? Send that spot of my app to Uber. And uh, you know, when the location is available, we use that to find the, uh, the match in Uber's inventory. Mm. Do you guys use React Native for anything? Uh, we don't use React Native, although we're very happy users of React for our web front end. Okay. Very interesting. Have you thought about using React Native? Yeah, it's a great question. We've done some internal demos of it. And one of the challenges we have is we, this is something that's new to me too. You know, in previous jobs, I was always kind of my customer or, you know, building something B2C. As a company offering an SDK, we have some unique challenges or rather constraints. And one of those is our SDK sort of has to be compatible with the lowest common denominator. So that means like we don't get to use all the bells and whistles on Android or on iOS. And uh, React Native is something we'd love to offer, but a lot of our partners don't use it or don't have a need for it yet. So we just haven't pursued it. Mm. Yeah, I, I can imagine that adding some extra complexity. So on Software Engineering Daily, I, I do like to talk some about how developers can, I guess, empower themselves a little more, like maybe in terms of from a business mindset, like I think more developers could think about sort of monetizing their their own software engineering or, or spinning up businesses if they like to. And I think Button is an interesting example for how developers might be able to think about this in kind of more sophisticated ways. So give me an idea for how the monetization of Button works. Like if I include a button that's giving referrals to Uber, do I get kickbacks as a person who has integrated Button in, into my app? Yeah, this is the part that's really exciting to me as, you know, someone who has a, a history of, uh, well, uh, side projects and apps that I uh, never quite figured out how to monetize. <laughs> of course, you know, taking a step back, your options today are somewhat limited. There's not a lot of interesting stuff happening with app monetization. You know, you can show display ads and, and banner ads, but that's boring and often, you know, deleterious to the user experience. There's also uh, Amazon's doing something really interesting with Underground, but I, I don't know how well it's uh, taken off. So, you know, our business is uh, very much aligned with you, the developer. Button is, as you asked, we get paid when someone drives a transaction. And that varies from partner to partner, but at a very high level, if you see a button for, let's say, a restaurant reservations provider, and you go and install an app. Uh, so Button gets paid for driving that install, and we share that with uh, you, the uh, audience application. And then if you follow a button, whether or not the app is installed, end up performing a transaction, there's a something like an affiliate fee that we get paid or an affiliate commission for transactions we drive. So basically, we don't get paid for showing you a button. We don't get paid for distracting you. We get paid for making the right match. So as a developer looking to monetize your app, we do really well when we can complement your experience and uh, delight your users rather than distract them and find a stray click and uh, you know they end up going back anyway. Hmm. So the way that, that apps work on phones today is generally you have to download an app to make it work, but there are all these 
Exper- well, maybe not a lot of them, but uh, there are are these different kind of experiments or experiences that I've seen people developing where you have a really light kind of web experience that is so light it doesn't even require an app install. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious like what your vision is on kind of the future of how apps are going to work on the phone. Like, well, in the future, will I be able to have a button in my app that I can click that will open up, I don't know, some lightweight app rather than uh, requiring me to already have Uber installed, for example? Really, really great question. And it is a an area of fascination for us and something that uh, very much relates to kind of our business. But, you know, putting the business aside for a moment, we're all developers, and yeah, the anachronism of an app store seems kind of odd in uh, you know today. You know, why do I need to download an app? Why does that exist? And we spend a lot of time just kind of debating in the hallways this and kind of what the future of app stores is. And I think we're at an interesting point where you know you don't necessarily need an app store. You could very much build, or in you being you know the major platforms, Google and uh, and Apple. It could make you know dynamic class loading something that happens, and you kind of see signs of this with what Apple's done with like uh, app slimming in uh, iOS, I believe it's called. And uh, on the Android side, Android's been able to dynamically load code for a long time. The interesting part is it feels like the app stores have an incentive to remain that toll booth. In other words, even if the technology allows kind of dynamic web style application updates and programming. They want to funnel you through the app store. So we're not exactly sure where that's headed. But when you look at what we do, we try to teleport a part of your app into another app. And we would love a platform that makes that possible. Really, Button exists because iframes don't exist on mobile. And HTTP referrers and links are totally non-uniform on mobile. So there's an aspect of what we do that um, is really just bringing those concepts that work well on the web to mobile. Hmm. So kind of taking a first principles type of approach to thinking about this, what are the things that we actually need on mobile apps? Like, you know, for example, because like I open up Gmail, for example, and and a container spins up somewhere on Google's infrastructure and opens up a connection between the app on my phone and the container over at Google. And it feels like most of the work is being done on that container. Obviously, there's, you know, there's some stuff going on on my end, but I guess I'm wondering like, how much of the heavy duty work that I feel on my phone, how much of that do I really need like a client side device for? Yeah, well, I think you could find a lot of different answers to that. You know, I, a few years ago, there were a few startups that were trying to do something more akin to like app streaming, right? Just take like a MPEG video stream and stream it down to your, your phone. Or, you know, I think there was a, a game company that did this as, as well send an input stream back and, uh, you know, then you have kind of a future proof, like thin client, you know, you just need to render something and send kind of device inputs back to the cloud, but all the application logic and all the applications live kind of at the far side of that. I don't know. I think, you know, you follow this. I think the answer is we have everything we need in some ways, right? We have browsers and we, we have the native UI and people prefer native UIs and native apps for, I think, a lot of usability reasons and and some latency reasons, but the platform is already quite general purpose. Mm. So I'm, I think, yeah, it's hard to predict where the world is going, but you can certainly see how the technology is already there. Okay, certainly. Oh, so, so rather than my abstract predictions about the future, let's talk about the present. So for many years, apps did have a lot of trouble doing context switching. I remember going from app to app used to be a little more painful, but it seems like things have gotten to where apps really do play nice with each other. Are there some fundamental changes that have occurred that improve this context switching? Yeah, you know, I think number one, just uh, developer and and user appetite. Starting with Android, Android was almost over-designed for sharing. When, when it came out, it had all these ways for developers to express different verbs they support. You know, I support view contact and you support uh, show web page and every part of the system could be pluggable. And it wasn't until, or I think it, you know, I, I don't know exactly when, but it's not until recently where that sort of um, collaboration actually happens on Android. You know, most people, most applications weren't really taking advantage of that. And iOS has caught up as well, where, you know, I, I think starting with a version or two ago, 
There's better support for uh, deep linking. There's the kind of the back button in the title bar, you know, small change like that that's been baked into Android since day one is now there on iOS, so you know where you came from. And then Apple recently with the launch of Universal Links is trying to kind of even further smooth the seams between, in particular, the web and native, but also between applications, just getting people to use uh, coherent linking schemes and strategies between their applications. Can you explain that in more detail? What are these linking technologies? Yeah, so on uh, iOS, uh, Apple launched something called Universal Links, which, and probably iOS experts will correct me quickly, but at a very high level, it's about declaring the mapping from uh, web URLs to mobile app um, URLs or you know states within a mobile app. So for example, use button.com slash about. If we had an app, it would go to the about page within our iOS app and within our Android app. So Apple and Android support something similar. So by encouraging developers to make these routable URLs, it means that more of the application can work independently or can be linked to directly. So you see this like when you open, you know, a Twitter link from Chrome for, or from mobile Safari, it goes directly to the tweet within Twitter. Mm. What are the other kind of mobile APIs and changes in the mobile landscape that, that Button takes advantage of or that, that you find yourself thinking about with Button? Yeah, well, I mean, we're very, very, you know, we watch very closely where the platforms are going and um, where the industry is going. And, you know, we, I guess the first answer is we expect to be surprised in some way. You know, we, we wouldn't, I, I guess maybe surprise is the wrong word, but we, you know, on the App Store question, for, for instance, like Apple could wake up tomorrow and declare that, you know, apps are now dynamic and there's a smaller toll booth, but the way code is distributed has fundamentally changed. So we're very much eager to see something like that or, or looking for kind of the, the next change in kind of distribution because we very much uh, work at this level. We facilitate kind of discovery and interoperability between applications. So some of what we do is kind of filling in the cracks in the platforms. Tell me more about that. Like I, We've done a bunch of shows where the guest has said something somewhat um, expectant at the App Store world changing. Like We did all these shows about React Native, and yeah. React Native really seems kind of... Uh, no, nobody from the React team has said anything like this, but to me, React Native seems like this real existential threat to Android and iOS. If if Android and iOS like don't get the App Store experience fixed, if they don't get their distribution model fixed, then Facebook is just going to build some mobile platform with a better App Store experience, and it's going to potentially destroy iOS and or Android. Maybe that's a little too conspiratorial <laughs> for your taste, but regardless, it, clearly this App Store experience is terrible and there needs to be some better distribution mechanisms. What is that going to look like? And like, have you seen signs of the future that we're evolving towards? Yeah, well, and, and by the way, I could probably subscribe to some of those conspiracies about Facebook. <laughs> I mean, I would not, you know, they had a little bit of a flop with the uh, the launcher a year or two ago, but they're, you know, I would not. Who cares? I mean, what is that, a billion dollars? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I would, you know, I'm. I'm certain... And they got Messenger out of it, by the way. Yeah, that's true. The Messenger is the new hotness. Uh According to what I read. So, yeah, well, I mean, let's look at Discovery and see how, like, maybe a change in the App Store could help that. I think the problem is you want to get rid of a step, right? Like mobile web and web discovery is easy. I can tell you a URL and now you know how to get what you wanted. You know, go to softwareengineeringpodcast.com or google.com, right? I can print that on a billboard. I can send you that in an email. A uh, URL is basically universal and there's no extra step between, you know, accessing that content and having, you know, the, the functionality of whatever it was. So in my mind, greater discoverability and less presence of an app store starts with that. And um, now Apple's building up an index of basically host names and so on to applications. It wouldn't be a stretch technologically to say like plopping in a URL automatically opens an app. That requires like some platform facilities like, you know, dynamic uh, code loading. But the app store doesn't really need to exist if you're not purchasing the application. Mm. Okay, interesting. So we've talked a lot about the client side engineering of when somebody wants to use Button and how Button kind of works on the client. I'd love to understand more of the back end. So when somebody clicks on a button on their own device, 
what is happening on on the server side? Like when how is that request being communicated through button and what's going on in the back end? Yeah, I'm probably uh, a little more qualified to answer this than uh, <laughs> brilliant pontifications about the future. Uh, my our head of product, uh, Chris, is uh, is very great at uh, that stuff. Yeah. So what's happening under the hood is basically our job is to within a single request response cycle find something to fill in that button or nothing at all that can all, that can be just as important of a decision. So under the hood, we have basically a, a collection of services that contribute to fulfilling that response. So the first thing that happens is our SDK shows up at our API front end and says, what have you got for me? The contents of that request include any developer specified context, like the user's current location, or if you're looking at a particular POI, like let's say you have an open table ID for something that's included. But basically everything about the state of the app that the developer wants to send is included in that request. Then our rule system and campaigning engine kicks in. So basically there are constraints on both sides. You may only want to show an Uber button or an open table button. Uber and open table may be offering different things depending on, let's say, you know, the locale of the device, uh, the location of the device, and so on. So all of these things are evaluated and we determine what would the best match be. And then from there, we go out to our uh, third-party API integrations. So let's say we determine that we want to show OpenTable. We query OpenTable um, specific to their API and uh, get a list of, let's say, available seatings at the restaurant that's closest to your request. And we structure that and send it back along with uh, attribution token, which OpenTable can use to credit any reservation to your application. Hmm. So... If I was a developer before Button and I wanted to have some sort of open table integration, what did I have to do? Yeah, it's not rocket science. So at a high level, you need to adapt to their API. So you need, you know, whatever their their API is. You need an API key. You need to basically figure out how to query it, get the response back in the format you like, and send it back to your mobile application. So does Button simplify the experience in any way, though? Yeah, you know, I think for as a developer, you really see the benefit once you light up your second button or your second destination. So OpenTable is great in the U.S. Maybe there are better options abroad. or I mean, it's certainly the case for a lot of different categories, like food delivery, for instance. We basically make it so that you don't really have to care where the user is going. We can find the best match. And maybe that's something that's region-specific. Maybe we know that Mikey prefers delivery.com over Seamless or something like that. We can make all of those decisions, and uh, you're getting kind of the same response message type, regardless of who the provider is. So if I, can I design, like, let's say I want to design a button that summons the best ride, depending on price, and I, like, this is the, this is Mm -hmm. the holy grail button, right? (laughs) The the button that covers Lyft and Uber, and somehow contacts your servers and does some kind of price calculation between Uber and Lyft. How realistic would that be? That's very realistic. We're not a partner with Lyft, so we can't provide that specific button today. But I think the general facility is that, you know, maybe there are five different places I could order Pad Thai from. One of them's cheaper or one of them's closer or one of them advertises a shorter delivery time. We can compute all of those as constraints and express all of them as constraints in our campaigning engine and then determine which the best is for you. Okay, so there are like contemporary applications for this type of thing like you could if i wanted a button in my app where i could click it and it's like give me the give me the cheapest chinese food that could be doable or is there like yeah yeah another example is uh, we work with a couple different restaurant reservation commerce partners so let's say you're you know a travel application or a mapping application what's the closest you know food out from my restaurant we could find that or entertainment's another great option. Maybe Ticketmaster has a concert nearby today, but not tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So we can do that query, you know, agnostic of who the supplier is, but based on other constraints, whether it's distance, cost, that sort of thing. Mm, okay. So is, is there a way that the developer can give you code to run on the back end when the button is clicked, or is that not really in the purview of what you guys so, do? yeah. So you mean for kind of expressing what you want to show up? Or... Well, I can just, I can imagine like somewhat complex experiences, like where you want to click on the button and then you want kind of maybe more stuff done. Or maybe let's say there's like a multi 
like let's say I want to click on the button and I want to tell the button to do something that requires them to communicate with Uber twice. So in the, under that scenario, I would need to include some sort of conditional logic in how my button works that that button is aware of. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So there's, I think the answer is yes and no. So some really comprehensive and, and complex use cases are possible with the, the way you just model things in our platform. So for instance, and, and this... Uh, the UI for this is in beta. It's not on the public website yet. But under the hood, you as a publisher can say, okay, show Uber if it's raining and at nighttime. Otherwise, if there are tickets nearby this location, show Ticketmaster. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, show food delivery. And so those kind of like conditional rule sets are uh, very doable. And they can also include information that you send up in your request. So if you send up a flag that, you know, we don't really know anything about, just some free form you know, string that says, oh, is VIP true? You can also build rules around that. So we have partners that use that to incorporate signals that we wouldn't other, otherwise have access to. Raining is a great example. Like if you have a better source of weather data, then we can just use that and incorporate that into the rules. Mm. Okay, so you've talked some about this back end. You mentioned campaigning, some of the campaigning system. So I guess who would run a campaign? Explain what that campaigning system is. Yeah, so we look at it as, at some level, our platform provides a way for commerce partners, you know, the folks that you would be linking into, to publish their buttons. So Uber is a great example of this. You know, they did a rebrand uh, a few months ago, and maybe they want to go change their logo everywhere or on 50% of the population or change the strings, for instance. So in our system, by default, campaigns are owned by those uh, recipient commerce partners, and they get to choose what is offered. Button sort of originated from a loyalty idea where uh, a company like Uber or OpenTable could offer different incentives depending on you know who the user is. And that sort of is built from that perspective. So if I want to offer a food button in my app, I don't by default have a lot of expressivity or maybe I don't even care about what you know color the button is or what text is in the button. That's something that the commerce partners can vary and target based on, you know, their own constraints. Mm, okay. So, and you've talked about how you don't want Button to become like an advertising company or at least rigidly thought of as an advertising company, but certainly any platform that somewhat resembles advertising is going to have some kind of bidding engine and like a some kind of marketplace that does matching in the background. Do you have something like that, like a like a matching engine or like a bidding and, or an auction system? So we don't have an auction system, and it's one of the things we've been resistant to. We will try to find the best match for a given context, regardless of kind of what our payment structure is with that commerce partner. It's a system that affords us, uh, you know, kind of as engineers, a lot of independence to work on and research the kind of quality portion of our system without worrying about, you know, the revenue optimization portion of our system. Is there something about the auction style way that, that things have been done? Like, I mean, well, at least with the advertising, maybe, maybe the, the analogy between advertising and what Button offers is a little thin or ragged, but certainly my impression of like the way that the back end systems for online advertising auctions are built just makes for all these weird perverse incentives <laughs> that really just make the whole ad ecosystem really toxic. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I think. You know, if let's say we, we decided to make our, our platform, you know, a, you know, an auction system, that wouldn't be what we're here to do. We, we think of button as if you took away a button in an application, you would be taking away a feature, something useful. And those that, you know, want to pay the highest dollar amount might not be the best match for that system. And, you know, we're also, you know, we're not paid on impressions. We're not paid for just clicks. We're paid for commerce that we drive. So... There's no benefit to us in serving something at a higher bid if it's not relevant to you because you're not going to buy it. Right. So what about the future? I mean, how, how do you, I guess you described this as some kind of tension between, between doing the, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. The tension between uh, the traditional kind of display advertising world and... Well, yeah, like the tension between that and like how you build button out going into the future. How do you avoid the kind of problematic relationships that have existed in the ad tech market? 
Well, yeah, great question. So we, I think we start by looking at ourselves as this platform for building connections between companies and businesses, not by building my relationship is with whomever the highest bidder is. So in many cases, partners that have added a button will bring business to us. They'll say, this worked great. We've been trying to work with this other company for a year, and they don't have a product team to spin up around this, but we'd really like this thing to appear on the boarding pass or whatever. Can we use you to do that? Yes. So we want to be kind of the rails between applications, not this greatest bid platform. So I guess you can look at our businesses as uh, and the partnerships we struck as being very strategic in various different areas of kind of everyday life, entertainment, transportation, food, and so on. We're focused on kind of matching moments and, uh, you know, very kind of moment-specific contexts rather than, hey, there's some eyeballs available here, like, and we're not distracting them with an ad. We should be. Sure. Okay, so we should talk more about the back end. I know I got distracted from that uh, (laughs) again. But so give me an idea of like the kind of languages and the different platforms of service products you guys use and what your kind of back end systems look like. Yeah, sure. So our back end is comprised of maybe half of a uh, half a dozen services. We're service oriented first and you know, we're familiar with uh, very familiar with arguments on kind of either side of uh, monolith first versus not. I'd say we've been very happy with uh, our architecture thus far. Language-wise, we're primarily Node.js and some Python. We try to be somewhat language agnostic in the sense that we want to use the right tool for the job. So, you know, the parts of our stack that are Python, for instance, we just found better support and um, uh, had better support for some of the things we wanted to do there. We're based on Amazon. We, a lot of us are kind of infrastructure geeks. I come from a very like infrastructure heavy background, but we're also a startup and we have product to build. So we tend to think about and design our systems kind of from first principles, but then look at the parts that like, ah, you know what, we don't have the cycles to build our own replicated MySQL setup. So we'll pay Amazon to do that for us. So we make, you know, kind of strategic build versus buy decisions when we're um, building out the stack. Did you consider Google or Azure? Not Azure, but certainly Google. You know, I think they have a great product. And we just had a little more operational experience with AWS when we were getting started. So uh, we stuck with it. But we'd like to think that if we needed to switch cloud providers, it wouldn't be an enormous change. Or if we wanted to multi-home across different uh, cloud providers, it'd be a matter of, you know, maybe rewriting some of our operational scripts and abstractions. But we're not, we're basically dependent on VMs and not uh, more specific uh, services. Okay. So it sounds like you haven't, I guess, bought into many of the platform-specific Amazon services. Yeah, you know, all of our services are um, designed as kind of single role HTTP services are kind of tooling wise. Everything is uh, built into a Docker container. So we use Amazon's ECS service for scheduling them, although we had some we did some work on Mesos and we looked at Kubernetes and we could use either of those platforms if we needed to um, or if we you know, were unhappy with ECS. Yeah, we've done a bunch of shows on Mesos versus Kubernetes versus whatever else lately is what's your take on that like is there is it just a matter of preference or is there a functional difference between these different platforms yeah there are some important differences although i'm a little rusty cuz uh, we went through kind of the analysis about 3 or 4 months ago so yeah i, I don't know if i'd be uh, i'd probably <laughs> piss some people off making a direct comparison between uh, mesos and kubernetes i mean at a high level they they have somewhat similar goals just different kind of architectural decisions and strategies i know kubernetes for a while worked great on compute engine but i'm not sure how much it's evolved on other platforms you know compute engine has some nice things like you always get the same IP as a lease, or you can dynamically detach and reattach volumes, and that's cool, but uh, not all cloud providers support that. So with, with Amazon's container system, what are the benefits that you get by using that platform? I haven't done any shows about that, so I'm very unfamiliar on about the ECS. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, we've been pretty happy with it. So basically, whether you're using VMs or one of these container schedulers, a good portion of your time might be spent on kind of bin packing your services. Like, oh, we need to scale up this service, so we need to fire so up. So explain, explain what that means, that term bin packing. Bin packing, right. Classical CS problem. So 
picture the bag person at your local grocery store. You've got you know, a box of Kleenex, some apples, whatever. It's basically about the density you can achieve in any given you know, volume of space. So uh, how do you efficiently pack those groceries into a bag? It's a lot like how do you efficiently slice and dice uh, resources available on a system among different services. So NP complete problem, very hard to achieve <laughs> automatically. So at some level, whether you're managing VMs or you're using container scheduling service like ECS, you have to decide basically how much memory or uh, CPU or other resources to allocate to each service. Okay, so is it like you're buying X number of VMs and you need to be able to slice up those VMs and pack as many containers into each VM as possible? Yeah, so the goal of like Mesos and uh, ECS is as much as possible, it's to abstract all of your kind of bare metal or VM resources into one homogenous pool of, you know, I have 300 CPUs available and, you know, 200 terabytes of disk, launch a service that needs two CPUs and two terabytes of disk and, you know, just pull from that pool of resources. Hmm, okay. So what's your model for, like, how you deal with, with each service? So, for example, you know, you've, you've got some a uh, way of relaying communication between a user's app and the user clicks a button, an Uber button, for example, and that hits your servers and then you route that to Uber. But then you've, you know, you're know you going to be scaling up to having all these different partners. So you already have a you know, bunch of partners already. Do you have a separate container for each request type or how do you partition that? Yeah, so we kind of the service boundaries in our stack tend to be based on role. So for instance, one service in our stack is a dumb request multiplexer. You know, our front door API service, its job is to basically terminate requests and route them to different, you know, backend services depending on what's needed, but very kind of very little state. One of those services is the service that uh, talks to all of our third-party API providers. So currently all of those live in a single service. Uh, we haven't needed to break that up into distinct services. But the point is, if you look at our architecture, there's another box that is sitting there with a lot of outgoing connections to various corners of the world and to services whose uh, quality of service we don't control. So, yeah, that's kind of a, a basic division. We, uh, you know, as with any production infrastructure, we monitor everything somewhat obsessively. So every layer of our stack, every service, every style of thing that happens within those boxes, we keep metrics on and we, uh, we build alerts around what are the big back-end engineering challenges that you're dealing with right now? Yeah, so one of the kind of fun ones is as we grow, we have a lot of data. And uh, we're very cautious stewards of that data. You know, number one, um, when a partner works with us, their customers become our customers. So we need to be very safe with their data, for instance. We segregate everything by default. And then we have a lot of data to process. Uh, so as, you know, button as button customers and our, our uh, publisher customers use buttons and tap on things and make purchases, we have a large stream of uh, event data coming in. So there are some very fun event analysis and you know sort of big data processing challenges behind the scenes. Do you have much of a data engineering pipeline built out, or are you trying to scale the product first? Yeah, we do have a, a pretty substantial uh, data pipe built out. So we have uh, two data scientists who uh, come from... Uh, really uh, awesome uh, mathematics background. And, you know, we've been able to do some cool stuff, even, you know, we're sort of in our infancy and we feel the space is growing and we see signs of it every day. But for instance, we've been able to do things that sort of test the power of the platform. Like for instance, where we show an Uber button, one day we said, hey, it'd be cool if we showed the time estimate in that, that button text instead of just the generic ride there with Uber. And uh, so we, we did an A-B test, or actually I think it was an A-B-C test, where we had one form of the button that said, ride there with Uber, another form that said, get there in you know, X minutes with Uber, and another form that said, get there for X dollars with Uber. And so our rule system was set up to basically divide this among you know, equal populations of uh, control and experiment traffic. And you know we were able to basically run the experiment, set it and forget it for a week, and then come back and look at the aggregates uh, output by the data pipeline and see that the variation that said uh, that had the time-based uh, text performed far better than the other two. How much? What was the margin like? 
Uh, ooh, now I forget, but it was uh, double digits better. It was something like, wow. uh, I think, and I think that was basically tap to view ratio. But, um, you know, our hypothesis was confirmed that people would rather see kind of a immediacy based call to action, like you'll be there in 10 minutes versus spending money, like you're going to spend $20 and get there. So can companies themselves, can like Uber itself say, I want to launch an A-B test campaign through their button? Yeah, exactly. If you use our, our site, you won't see some of these options specifically because we've been, you know, we're still growing and we've been catering to a lot of big companies who probably wouldn't use our dashboard even if the features were there. But under the hood, we'd be set these up all the time where our partner's interested in, you know what, let's serve something slightly different to Spanish-speaking users or um, let's do a test about the efficacy of different text or copy or that sort of thing. And if I'm a developer that is adding an uber button can i do my own eb testing that way also or yeah so not currently and this is uh, kind of one of the constraints that we currently have where basically uber or the kind of the destination commerce partner is in charge of what gets shown right. that's where you know i hesitate to make an advertising comparison but think of kind of like the adsense world where you just like embed something on your site and you trust that the, the system finds the right match so it's really um a constraint we've chosen to simplify the work of a developer, but it's something we've, uh, you know, we're always thinking about expanding on. Are there going to be buttons that you kind of want to avoid having on your platform? Or like, do you have your own approval process? Like if I'm, for example, if I'm some virus distribution site, you obviously <laughs> don't want me, you know, having <laughs> having an install the virus button yeah. on the button platform. For sure, for sure. So we try to basically be a broker. So let's say kind of more realistically, like um, I'm a food delivery business and you want to put a button in your app, but you're a, I don't know, a competitor or something. Bad example. But basically we have a, <laughs> a we have a system where uh, our commerce partners can express, uh, you know, we basically built an approvals queue. So if you're the, the destination, the commerce partner, and I ask to put a button in your app before you can light that button up, they have to flip a switch that says, yeah, this is approved. This, this isn't, you know, Mikey's porn app. So <laughs> other than that, though, you know, we try to, I think like any kind of technology platform should, we try to avoid editorializing or, you know, getting involved in kind of the policy between partners. So I don't think this is a realistic likelihood for us, but, you know, let's say two porn apps wanted to offer, you know, porn buttons to each other. Like, well, we could provide the technology to do that, but we... Um, you know, it's based on kind of mutual approval. Right. Okay. So interesting. So I want, I want to begin to close off and I have one kind of tangential question, which is I have this big fascination with advertising fraud and this it has woven through our conversation at the fringes. I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but like, what is your impression of the advertising, the online advertising landscape? Like how much fraud is there? Why is there so much fraud? I mean, <laughs> what, what's going on with ad tech? Yeah. Well, there's fraud in traditional ad tech at different levels. You know, there's kind of the most basic like click fraud where I'm putting AdSense on my site and I, I want a few extra bucks. So I open an incognito window and click the ads on my own site to, you know, just underperformance and kind of a grayer area where like you're not really getting the, the traffic you paid for or you wanted. It's frankly a, a, a big space, but it's all it's a little different than the problems we have because we're sort of paid when a transaction happens. So to defraud Button or to defraud one of our commerce partners, you have to like book an Uber ride and then pay for it on a fake credit card. So basically you're committing some other kind of fraud, not just clicking on something. Uh, an order has to happen for us to, to credit either side. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I definitely like that about Button is there is this realness component to it. And I don't know, advertising has always just seemed like a, such a weird way of monetizing. And it's, you know, just the delta between how much money advertising makes online and how many people click on ads and how many people can say they are influenced by ads. I mean, obviously, it's impossible to detect for sure, because well, advertising does work to some extent. Like if I see an ad on my Facebook feed, I know that it does affect me somewhat, <laughs> but it's much less measurable than something like Button. And the biggest gatekeepers of internet opinion are have it in their best interest to convince you that advertising does work. 
even though it degrades the user experience. And I don't know, it's just all these dirty incentives. And uh, I wish there were a way to actually understand how much fraud there was, but yeah, it seems impossible. Yeah, it's sort of endemic to the way kind of display ads and kind of traditional advertising work. And frankly, it's something we hear from our customers and our potential customers. They're you know they're, they're just tired of ads. There's ad blockers. There's mm-hmm. you know the performance is so poor. You know you basically dedicate a slice of your website or your app to something that's only going to be good for the user. You know, 001 percent of the time, 001 percent of the time. You know, what's a good conversion rate, right? It's very, very low. So we've kind of, this is the part where, you know, we're a startup. We're doing something that we think is massive, but there's certainly risk. And we bet that basically the value, the product experience of what we do, while not nearly as uh, high impression as boring old ads, uh, is going to be way more valuable than, you know, the status quo. Right. More conversions, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, so... Final question. I want to get an idea for what the long-term view of Button is. Love like, it. Are you? Do you want people to build? Uh, you know, are people going to be building apps that are like completely just buttons? Like it's all button buttons and uh, like a mobile operating system type of thing of button buttons. Or <laughs> how big is the vision? Yeah, it's big. You know, I think this is. I've had trouble explaining Button to uh, friends and colleagues because what we do right now looks very simple. And in some ways it is. It's amazing when you look at, you know, as an entrepreneur, you look at business ideas and a lot of them are like, wait, that's just a better spreadsheet or a better <laughs> UI to a spreadsheet. And you're like, exactly. Like that's the, you know, you're, you're solving something in a, in a domain that's been underserved or neglected. And so what we do today looks somewhat simple, but down the road, like, you know, your questions about, you know, how the app store might change or app development. You know, we think about that all the time what would we have left if uh, tomorrow the way we build apps is exactly like the way we build stuff on the web? Well, we're a relationship broker and we have basically deep API and business relationships with everyone we work with. And maybe the way people develop apps changes tomorrow, but we're still in a position to orchestrate and connect the way people, you know, live their lives. So if tomorrow everything is voice driven, well, we can take all those kind of abstractions we built for this pretty rectangular button and apply that to a voice interface like, you know, Siri or Alexa or whatever. Bots are another kind of area where we're like, hmm, we don't really know if conversational commerce is the next big thing, but we're certainly doing a lot of R&D about it using kind of the, the platform, the data we have, the API connections we have and so on. And, you know, maybe in two or three or five years, like, Maybe everyone doesn't need an app. Maybe there are just five or ten apps we use every day, but we can power commerce for everyone else who doesn't have an app. We can build the customer relationships and uh, manage the exchange of data between applications. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in having a somewhat simple, terse product offering that has a lot of room to scale, especially in a world that is so frothy right now, (laughs) so much change going on that you could potentially capitalize on, but you'll only be well positioned to capitalize on if you've got your core offering in place, which it seems like you guys do. So, uh, all right. Well, Mike, thanks for coming on the show. This has been a really great conversation. Button is a super interesting company, and I'm really happy to have you guys on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.